So now the floor is open to questions for the next 15, 20 minutes. So fire away. Kamini. Kamini Singha, Colorado School of Mines. Um, I had a question that might relate to anything that any one of you were talking about, but um, I know that this is a, you know, a workshop in part about remote sensing, but it seems like soft data could potentially um, inform on water budgets or some of the systems that any of you are talking about. And I'm wondering if that's been anything that you've thought about using or sort of state of the science on in terms of using that sort of information. Hot yes. Uh, that's what I meant by using natural language processing to start getting a lot of information on uh, proxies. Uh, in fact, I view the remote sensing activity as a proxy source of information as well. So um, on demand uh, for, for or the extent of pumping and how groundwater levels might be dropping, an interesting proxy that we used in India was to get sales by district of pumps of different capacities and different types, because uh, the the interesting thing that you know when Matt was I, I don't remember I think Ali asked the question of Matt as to whether there was data availability in India uh, 10 15 years ago when we were we were able to get the data that was not a problem but the problem was most of the benchmark stations that they were monitoring for groundwater were in the upper 15 meters. And farmers were pumping at depth. So how do you actually make any useful you know, use of that data? And what we found was that uh, in the annual surveys, farmers reported whether or not they had bought pumps and at what depth they had installed them, et cetera. So we were able to reach out to uh, industry association for pump manufacturers. And they were able to give us data on the horsepower of the pumps, whether it was a summer submersible or a centrifugal and so on. And since then, Laurelyn, who's there, she's been also looking at uh, media reports of people reporting anything to do with groundwater quantity or quality, uh, geocoding that, and then comparing that with whether, whether or not there are academic research papers there. And you can see that there's going to be a divergence between those two kind of pieces of information. But it's the beginning. Uh, I think thinking about soft information um, for groundwater characterization, there's a long history you know, using faces and so on for stratigraphic information and then mapping it in. But using a more diverse source of information for con converging on budgets, I think is a beginning. Yeah, I was also going to just say that geologic cross-sections, geologic maps, you know, that might be a good place to look for. Yeah, Jim Butler, Kansas Geological Survey. Let me just build on... Uh, Dr. Singh's uh, question, and one of the most important soft data sources would be the distribution of pumping wells in these heavily pumped areas, because you'll see there are gaps in terms of uh, spatial coverage, and there's a reason for that, and there's a reason is regarding the transmissivity of the aquifer, the water quality, et cetera. So we need to really fully utilize that uh, piece of soft information as well. And let me also just uh, ask uh, the first speaker, Manu, about the deep groundwater in the Midwest. There are no shallow aquifers in those areas. Those shallow aquifers that you were showing were associated with streams, uh, channels, and uh, there's just not much uh, there used to be a shallow aquifer. The whole system used to be shallow, but we have changed that through time. So just something I wanted to uh, point out. I considered using an India uh, a, a picture rather than the US one, but I had the US one handy. So. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Please. Hi. Sorry. Good morning. Uh, Seagull from the World Bank. So we have several uh, projects. Uh, it's like the irrigation overuse the groundwater. And we are trying to manage the irrigation in agriculture so to reduce the groundwater overuse. So in our cases, the regional water balance is really important because we need it for the uh, water resources and location or management. 
But in our case, it's like we don't have data for how much groundwater was overused. So actually, like there are several questions. Like in practice, we are looking for the data available or the available tools or models can really like help us to solve those questions. So there are tools available to, to estimate groundwater use if you don't have those data, but Manu brought up some really big concerns with some of those tools. So typically they'll, they'll look at uh, the water demand. So, so you'll get evapotranspiration, you know, crop coefficients. Uh, you can estimate that with satellite data or, or with ground-based data if, if you know what, what crops are being grown. But, and then how much surface water is available. And, and I don't know if you have that information, but that's another challenging piece to get oftentimes. But, but then the big challenges are, are people over irrigating their crops or are they under irrigating their crops? And, and that one is, is really challenging to, to know. If, if you have some estimates of soil moisture, you get a sense of if they, you know, if the soil moisture is, is not changing much over the growing season, then, then you get a sense of that. But, but again, it's a very challenging thing to estimate without having that actual data set. Let me ask something to you guys on the uh, table here. Uh, how about electricity? Is electricity a good surrogate for uh, pumping? Or is there, uh, it, can you discern the signal between the electricity used in a pump and in a house? I mean, obviously, they're using yeah, house. So we, we spend quite a bit of time trying to work our way through that. Uh, if you assume that the pump efficiency is the textbook efficiency, it's an exact measure. The problem is that the pump efficiencies were all over the place when we tested pumps. But uh, in response to you know, your question, what I was going to say was there's a major pump manufacturer in India called Kirloskar, and we had extensive discussions with them. For them to add a water meter into each pump and then uh, have it recorded and be made available through various ways, that's only a 10 or $15 add-on to each pump, and they're willing to do it. Their reaction was, there's no market for this pump, because you know, uh, it's the question that was brought up on data earlier. Why, why would someone want to collect that information? The government should, the World Bank should, uh, anybody who's trying to manage should. So if, there, if it was mandated by the government that all wells have to have pumps which have a meter built into it, they would totally make it. And then the cost would come down because of volume of sales. And then you have direct data on each use, which if you're trying to manage is actually very important because all the surrogates don't really help you. Go ahead, Go ahead Jim. Okay, this is Jim Butler, Kansas Survey again. I agree completely with your comments on water use, and here I'm going to brag about a bit about the state of Kansas because we do have all of the high-capacity uh, pumping wells are metered and reported annually, and it's subject to regulatory verification. So that sort of data set we as a community need to exploit so that we can assess some of these me methods and get a feel for how folks are operating in the field. So uh, I think on the electricity, using electricity information uh, as a surrogate, one issue is that you have other aspects like subsidy and other things that really completely mask what is actual consumption for, of electricity for withdrawing. So that, that's one issue. Uh, the other question that I wanted to pose is we do see, or in other words, in, in academia, we talk about conjunctive management. We do have a detailed, you know, like for example, if it is surface water management, reservoir rule curves and other things available. But on the other hand, conjunctive management in a detailed way, how this is how it should be operated, there is nothing existing. A closure on the management part is really a big challenge. I mean, even in places where you have significant groundwater extraction, you don't have a detailed information on this is where this is how it's going to operate. So an integrated planning doesn't exist at all because groundwater, to some extent, is appropriated very locally, and uh, so it's a very big challenge. Go ahead. 
This is Jessica Lawson, Millennium Challenge Corporation. I uh, just to circle back to the electricity question and thinking about uh, and and the question from uh, the World Bank a little earlier. Speaker, a participant from the World Bank, um, thinking about the international development context and places where we are most data limited are often agriculturally dependent places. In many times, if we're talking about sub-Saharan Africa, there's increasing exploitation of groundwater in off-grid areas. So electricity information is going to be very challenging there because the pumps are either solar or diesel generator powered. It's just yet another challenge in terms of filling in the picture where the data is most needed. Hi, Jim Dobrovolsky, USDA, NIPA. Um, Mark? So how fresh is fresh, and um, is there a temporal shift to these volumes, and how about a major use scenario that you think of for these continental shelf sands that hold these large volumes? Okay, um, how fresh is fresh? Um, the uh, magnetotelluric system's uh, image formation resistivity, so we don't know... Um, whether some of the more, um, um, well, I would say we don't know. Um, the wells, offshore wells, the salinities are in many cases under 1,000 milligrams per liter, but they can get up into brackish conditions of uh, 5,000 milligrams per liter. So some water treatment may be required to um, produce these waters and use them. Uh, both Holly, Michaels, and I have done calculations that suggest that you could develop these uh, offshore fresh water for 30 years, but eventually it's a non-renewable resource, and eventually you'll get seawater intrusion. What was your second question? Whether it had a temporal variability. Um, a Good question. We think these are quite old groundwaters, um, probably a Pleistocene age, uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years old as a result of emplacement over many sea level cycles. And in terms of a major development scenario, um, coastal megacities um, potentially could use these resources in times of extreme drought, thinking about Cape Town or Sao Paulo that had experienced these recent droughts. Um, it, I, would, I would pitch this as a backup water supply, or even for New York City if their aqueduct system failed. Um, but this is expensive. Uh, offshore wells are $5 million, just the exploratory wells, uh, and piping to the um, land and desalinization facilities to maybe clean the water up. Those are all un unknowns, as well as whether it's got arsenic in it or not, or other contaminants. So there's, this is a new area that I think is worth pursuing, but there's a lot of unknowns. And so far, nobody has developed these resources because of the cost, I think. Mark, I just wanted to do a follow-up question. Did, I think I missed it when you were talking. Is there depth to water a kilometer or so? It's less than a kilometer. It's okay. somewhere between 400, 200 to 400 meters depth um, offshore. Okay. So then my reaction is this. This is a non-starter. Sorry. I'll explain why. Uh, the energy requirement for desalination of seawater is 120 meters. So if you could basically take ocean water directly and desalinate it, the energy cost of that is already a third of the energy cost that you're going to have for pumping this up. So, and then if you still have to treat it uh, and the well is deeper and more expensive, then economically it won't be competitive. Well, um, I, I'm not an expert on the transmission system and pumping system issues, but um, the cost of desalinating brackish water is a lot lower than desalinating seawater. So did you sure. but I think that that's, in? It's about 30 meters equivalent head for brackish, 120 meters for fully uh, seawater. But if you're pumping from 500 meters, you've already trumped all that. Um, okay, that may well be. Um, in some of the wells that have been drilled, like off of Florida, there are artesian conditions. Um, okay, fair. So there's, um, we don't really know what the head conditions are okay. in a lot of these systems, but they're, um, um, yeah, yeah, and on Nantucket, where I have experienced, the, the deep aquifers are under artesian conditions and higher okay. than the shallow aquifers, but uh, that may be the case that it's not, that's not universal.
We have two questions from online. Um, this is from Francisco Munoz Ariola from the University of Nebraska. Uh, the context was data and uncertainties in numerical modeling and diagnosis. Um, and his questions are, how can we identify and use socio-hydrological variables and processes that could lead to address the challenge of meeting water demands? And how could we compare the uncertainties from geophysical data and socio-hydrologic data? Yes, that was uh, the question to Holly, because her talk was on that. Would, would that be reasonable, or was it just to the panel? I think that conflict is always there. You know, on the one hand, uh, when we work with groundwater systems, and you take a, put a lot of effort into the characterizing the physical system, the criticism always is that the social factors are poorly constrained, and then sometimes it's the other way around. Uh, with a lot of metering and everything, uh, you probably get a good sense of the withdrawals, but uh, some other aspects, uh, ideally you want both, and even if you have both, you probably can't get water quality right, as Holly showed, because uh, it takes a lot less effort and detail to get a just the you know, water quantity model right for groundwater. But once it comes to water quality and contaminant concentrations and things like that, uh, you really want meter scale sometimes characterization. Carly, the second question? It is one more, right? How, how, how could we compare the uncertainties from geophysical data and socio-hydrologic data? That's a very site-specific thing. There are some places that are more data rich from the human side and others that are more data rich from the physics side. So let's uh, put an end to this panel and uh, go for lunch. I'm sure everybody is very hungry because we did not have enough food at breakfast today. It's my <laughs> biggest complaint. I'd like to uh, first uh, ask you all to uh, give a big round of applause to the panel.